Good evening, and thank you to all of you for coming out to this, uh, this talk about dementia. How many of you have family members who suffer from one of the dementias, or have friends or relatives? So probably the majority, and that would not be unusual in any audience that I ask that about. It's unfortunately a very common situation, and I deal mostly with the behavior problems that come very often in dementia. So I'm asked about people when they get agitated, when they get aggressive, when they're potentially going to kill someone else. That's the group that I work with. So, so I, I work with a, a fairly complex population, mostly in long-term care. And so what I'm going to be talking about are behaviors in general, why they happen, to get a little bit better understanding of uh, why we do certain things or the steps that we take when we're actually evaluating these people. And there'll be some videos along the way, so hopefully that'll keep things kind of entertaining. So at the, when, whenever we give presentations, either at conferences or in medical school, we always have to let people know if there's any kind of conflict. In other words, do I work for a pharmaceutical company that's paying me to tell you what they want me to tell you? And, and the answer there is no. So when we give talks to people in medical school or we're, when we're training residents, we pretty much go through this menu of items that we um, try to cover in discussing behavioral problems related to dementia. And I'm not going to be doing it this way because this would very likely put you to sleep. I, and, it, and it can be overwhelming information. But essentially, just to summarize a little bit what, what I'm actually telling the people is, first of all, we train them to look at what is urgent, trying to deal with those urgent situations. Uh, look to see if they can figure out what are triggering the behavior so that we can deal with those triggers. Um, manage the caregiver stress. That's a, a huge issue in the treatment of dementia whether the caregiver be the family, which is what in some literature are known as the informal caregivers, or the formal caregivers, which would be staff in nursing homes or in residences or in hospitals. Um, we train them to look for medical problems so that we can try to deal with those first. And one very common problem that we ask all the people that are training with us, whether they be physicians or nurses or others, is to look for urinary tract infections and constipation, because those things can make a tremendous difference. So what we're trying to do is rule out a whole bunch of things to get to uh, looking in more detail at more complex issues. And this is some more complex issues that I'm actually going to talk about today. Um, so the part that I'm really going to go over is more in this area. I'm very briefly going to say something about this, but primarily in this area, but not, not really the treatment, but how do we go about figuring out what might be the cause of the problems. So I try to make, I'm going to be including some neuroanatomy and neurophysiology, but I'm going to try to make it in an in a understandable way and also to illustrate how we even came up with some of these ideas. So first of all, one thing that we know is that in terms of behavior, behavior is a response to some form of stimulus. The stimulus can be inside our head, it can be outside our head, and that's part of the assessment that we're doing is to try to find out what is that stimulus, what is the trigger that results in the response, which is the behavior. When our brains are functioning normally, we have an intermediate step. We have the ability to make a choice whether or not we're going to do anything about that stimulus. How are we going to react to it? And so it's that choice part, which is the part that I'm dealing with more often. Another way to do this is to throw in a brain, make it a little bit more complex. So, 
and, and I'll do this with a story. So this is Joe. He's walking along in the forest, and he sees this thing in front of him. Okay, and right now it looks like a snake. So if I go to what I was talking about before, the choice that we're making as to what are we going to do about that snake happens in here. And we have basically two pathways of doing that. We have one pathway that's known as the fast pathway, or some people refer to this as system one. And then we have a much slower pathway that some people refer to as system two. The fast pathway is just you're reacting right away to what you see. So in this case, in a situation where there is something that is potentially frightening, um, Joe will respond to this as if it's a snake. It might not actually be a snake. It looks like a snake in the picture. But he refers, re, um, reacts to it as if it's a snake. And so when we have that kind of reaction, we have more blood going to our muscles to get ready to do something, whether it's to run away, which would be obviously in this situation might be the better thing to do rather than to try to fight with a snake. Um, and we have other physiologic things that happen to our body. And eventually what happens is that as this information gets processed, let's say it's actually a stick. Eventually it gets processed and he sees, okay, that wasn't a snake, that was actually a stick. It looked like a snake the first time around. And then he starts to feel better, but he's still sweaty, and he might be tremulous about, uh, with respect to that. So this is um, Joseph Ledoux, who wrote a really interesting book on the way we react to fearful situations, uh, goes through a lot of detail about this. And the way, way he puts it is that it's better to mistake a stick for a snake than a snake for a stick. Okay, so that's sort of the, the theme. We have this system inside our body that allows us to react very quickly, more quickly than a second system where we're actually finally realizing what's going on around us. So I'll make this in a slightly more complex way. And I'll go back to the fr uh, first one here. Uh, you'll, you'll notice here it says amygdala, here it says thalamus, they're different parts of the brain. There's the thalamus, there's the amygdala. The thal thalamus is the, sort of the train station of the brain. All, all the trains go in there, and then the thalamus decides what it's going to do with those. So you'll see in the thalamus we get stuff from the ear, the auditory stuff. What we see, what we feel, and then smell is a little bit different. Smell goes directly to a part of the brain called the amygdala. This is a very old part of the brain. It existed before there was uh, hearing and vision and, and feeling. So we still have these primitive systems that are hundreds of millions of years old going on in our brain. Some people refer to this part here altogether as the reptilian brain, where we have an immediate reaction to what we see. And then the amygdala is responsible for the reactions, and it's known as the four Fs. So fight or flight, which most of you have heard about in this kind of a context, but also seeking food and looking for sex. Right? It is a mixed audience. So I have to be careful about the <laughs> medical jokes that I use. So this is, this is the reptilian brain. So that's the system one, or the very fast process. This is uh, the newer part of the brain. So this is all this big part. And if we look at more primitive animals, this part is a lot smaller than what we have. So the sensory association and cortex. And then there's another area called the hippocampus, which is where our memories are stored. So basically, what happens here is that when events go on, the hippocampus remembers events. And then eventually, it learns and it tries to react to similar situations. So that's why sometimes uh, you might go somewhere and you get a very funny feeling and you look around try to wonder why why do I have this funny feeling oh okay it looks a lot like when I was walking down that pathway and I saw that dog that started to bark to me so it was a visual memory and we were having a reaction to that visual memory okay now delirium is a very common medical condition 
um, most frequently seen when people have very serious infections and they will start to hallucinate or get very confused. We often see these in general hospitals, but we see that quite a bit in nursing homes. And in uh, intensive care units, it's also quite common. The thing about delirium is that it, it makes this slow system, the system that processes the information, helps us decide what to do, not work as well. And then dementia and developmental delays and other neurologic problems cause, cause deficits in that area. And psychiatric disorders as well. And as I'm trying to illustrate here, even the memories we have, even good memories, can be blotted out by these different conditions. So what's happening here is that in these different situations, we're removing the ability of the person to have a choice on what they're going to do with what they hear or see or feel, or less so with the smell. Um, so more likely, they might have this very quick reaction that will end up in one of these things going on. And the ones that I'm dealing with most often in, say, long-term care would be uh, the, the, the fighting reaction. The other part about this that's interesting, and I'll bring it up later, is uh, this pathway, as I mentioned, there's this very old one, olfactory pathway, goes to the amygdala directly to these things. There are some treatments that have been studied in long-term care using aromatherapy, primarily Melissa oil and lemon balm. And those have been found to decrease levels of agitation in people who live, uh, who have dementia, who live in long-term care. And it, and it might work through this pathway. Problem is a lot of institutions, as you know, have a policy where you're not supposed to wear perfumes or other things. So if I look at this, I could actually say that the no sense policy makes no sense. <laughs> hmm. So the, the first, I'm going to show you a video now, and the video illustrates to some extent what I've just been talking, but using a very famous case. How many of you have heard of Phineas Gage? So a few of you. So if you, if you take psychology, you'll usually hear about Phineas Gage and first year psychology. And it's, it's one of the cases that amongst many others that taught us about different functions of the brain. So I'm going to switch over to the video right now about that. September the 13th, 1848, near Cavendish, Vermont. Just because a woman agrees to have a toe stepped on for one dance doesn't mean she's in love with you. I suppose you're after thinking that she's taken by yourself? Well, I'm taking her out tonight. I'll ask her for you. You liar! I have to know that she's visiting her parents tonight. And how do you know that, may I ask? Because she can only see me tomorrow night. I don't believe it. Well, you can ask her yourself tonight. After the late last night. Liar! One more like that, James! James, I'll go after this Dorothy myself. This is Phineas Gage. Ah. Come on now. Get up there and you start cutting down that brush. Uh. Benjamin, you get over here and start leveling off this timber. Hop to it. Come on, you lot. What are you looking at? Got a lot of yards to make today. Time's money. Set in there, Billy. Gage is an intelligent, well-balanced man. Feeling better now, James? Yeah. He's a modest and reliable person. He's in charge here because he can make careful, well-informed decisions. All parts of a healthy brain work together. The red emotional limbic system passes on its messages to the blue intellectual frontal cortex, the part of the brain which assigns priorities to the messages. Everything ready, Billy? Yep. Good. Give her lots of sun, Billy boy. Lots of sun. Okay. Give her lots of sun. Hang it up, Jerry! Get back there both at once! if you want to be working here tomorrow. Normally, the two brain systems keep thought and emotion in equilibrium. James! James? Yeah. Good. Here's a... Okay. Come on, help me to my fingers. 
Oh. I'm sorry. No, no, I'm okay. I'm sorry. No. Come on, lads. Let's get him to the village. Oh. 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 Almost a century and a half after Gage's accident, we can guess that his limbic system, frontal cortex, and the connections between the two were damaged by the passage of the tamping iron through his brain. The limbic system is now free to fire emotional messages without the restraint exercised by the frontal cortex. The young Edward Williams, a former railroad man himself, was the first doctor summoned. Can you walk? Yes. Let us through. The man's hurt. Oh. Oh, the tapping iron went right through his head. <laughs> Science's great interest in Phineas Gage was in how the severing of his frontal cortex from his limbic system completely changed his behavior and character. Come on, Phineas. Let us take you up to bed. Oh, no. Leave me alone. I just want to stay outside. Phineas, you'd be better inside. I'm staying right here! <laughs> It's Doc Williams. Who? Doc Williams. <laughs> Doc Williams. <laughs> he is working up for you, Doctor. Oh my gosh. Gage's words were prophetic. His historic case sparked widespread curiosity into how physical changes in the brain affect behavior. Oh God, Gage. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, enough of this nonsense, Sinus. Let's get you off yeah. the bed right now. Come on, come on. Oh, no. Oh, no. Easy, easy. <laughs> Samuel, I'm oh, back to work, eh, boys. Come on, in the house. Come on. Come on. Easy. I think I've got the last piece of bones. Oh. Watch out. See if there's anything else down there. My right hand is touching my left hand, clear through his head. Once the connections between the frontal cortex and the limbic system are gone, the limbic system is free to fire its messages of emotion uninhibited by the frontal cortex. And behavior becomes erratic and unpredictable. Ah. You know what I like, Doctor? Mm -hmm. I like to have my old dog up here. Come here, Beth! Here, boy! Come on! <laughs> uh, keep your heads down. Oh, Billy! Oh, oh! Uh, Billy, oh, wait. Keep your head still. Oh, we have to see the man, eh? Hey! Listen, easy, lie back. Let's see what we can do about your dog, Phineas. So probably now, now none of you will forget Phineas Gage. <laughs> so what happened in Phineas Gage is that that tamping iron basically cut this part away from that part, and then he basically reacted to things that were going on around him. So he survived after that. He lived another about 15 years. He went around to different fairs to demonstrate the, uh, the hole in his head and the piece of iron that went through that. He was never able to hold down a job. He was often got quite angry and uh, aggressive with people. Uh, his brain is still kept at Harvard. There's a little hole at the top. And this is a tamping iron went straight through from here through to there. You can just see the size of that thing compared to his head. So if you're in Boston, you can actually go take a look at that if you're interested. One thing that's, I'm going to shift a little bit now to, to some other things. One, th one thing that's very interesting about when we've done studies involving elderly people who are agitated or aggressive in long-term care facilities and this is sort of from all those studies that have been done, or, or a, a large number of them, is that there's a very large uh, placebo response rate. So, and a placebo, in this, these kind of studies, we give a medication and we give an inert substance. The medications, for the most part, did work a little bit better. I didn't indicate them in there because I don't really want to talk about them today. So the, they were marginally better than the placebo. But the placebo, it's striking in some cases, 60% of the patients were better. So what happens in these studies? So we go into the homes, 
and we meet with the patients who have dementia and we see them repeatedly and they're very nice research assistants that go in and talk to them and have them do rating scales. And so they get much more interaction with people. And that seems to be one of the very important elements. And so in spite of the fact that this part of the brain that was severed in Phineas Gage's part, uh, and essentially that's what's happening in dementia, that part of the brain is deteriorating, there are still things we know from studies that show that you can get responses that people are considering good without having to add medications just to do with the interaction. And it's from results like that and other things like that over the years that have made us very interested in looking for what are now known as non-pharmacologic management of behavior. So now I'm going to demonstrate also with you a little bit about how our brain works. These are lemons, obviously. So I want you to imagine that you're in a grocery store, and let's say for some reason in this grocery store they have a display of lemons and there's a chopping board that's out and a person is there cutting the lemons and opening them up and squeezing them and there's the, the scent of the lemon is going up and you're smelling it and, and they keep doing that and they're offering lemons for you to buy, squeezing more of it in the air. What's happening to you right now as you listen to my story? You're salivating. Are those real lemons? Those are just light from pixels on a computer screen. So you're getting a real physical reaction to something that's actually just going on in your brain. And, and that's a very important concept because that's the other thing that we're dealing with is that we're, when I talk about triggers, we're not necessarily talking about real things that are happening. We're also talking about what the person's imagination has done with what they see, and then they get a reaction, just in the same way seeing an image of a lemon projected on a screen. And my story about the lemon, the auditory bit, has given you a physical reaction. So a lot of the behaviors that uh, I'm asked to see in long-term care, and I've listed a few of these things, um, they don't respond to medication. There's some others that have partial responses, but uh, a lot of what we, we see don't actually respond to medications and can be very problematic. And so we, we have to get quite good at teasing out what's going on, what is resulting in this behavior, and what can we change either in the environment or change about the way the person sees what's going on, like the lemons, so that we don't get things that uh, could be potentially harmful to them or another person. So and I'll illustrate this a little bit with a story. And I won't give the answer about what to do with this story because I'm going to use this a little later on. So here's a case of A, it was 87. This is a fairly typical kind of case. Calmly lying in bed. I'm just going to read it from here. It's easier for my neck. <coughs> And she's approached by the staff for her morning care. And when the staff help to remove the blanket, she screams, hits, scratches, spits. She's injured several staff, and staff have called in sick when they hear that she is assigned to them. And, and quite often, these people, before I see them, they have been given medications to try to reduce the behavior that's happening. And I'm usually asked to go in, or actually, I should say, the nurses who work with me are asked to see these people because the medications aren't working. So it's actually my nurses do a lot of the work figuring out what the triggers are, teaching the staff in the long-term care to try to learn with them, and then I'm sort of brought along to put a rubber stamp on, on what people have done. So mo most of the, the, the glorious things I'm told about is actually not really me, it's someone else doing it. So. Here, here's an example of um, many different kinds of modalities that have been used. Some work, some don't work very well for different situations. So in this case, we're looking at this as the first step. We're trying to understand why is this behavior going on, 
is is it because um, the person who is displaying whatever behavior I'm dealing with is trying to communicate something to me, communicate either something that they don't like is going on or that's uncomfortable. And one of the things we have to realize, a lot of people who, that we see who have Alzheimer's, especially when they have more severe Alzheimer's, they can't tell us what's bothering them. In many cases, they've lost the words to be able to tell us. And so a lot of this is trying to do by trial and error, discovering what is the problem? Is it that there's not enough going on? Or is there too much that's going on? Um, are they bored? Are they lonely? And for each of those different areas, there's certain kinds of therapies or management that, has be, that have been studied over the years. The ones that I've indicated in bold are the ones that work better. And if they're bold and black, they generally only work when they're actually being used. And if they're in bold and red, and there's actually only one here, psychoeducation, that has some kind of persistent effect after. So I've mentioned a little bit about aromatherapy. I'm going to show you a video about what music can do. Um, who has never heard of that term, snoozlin? So quite a few. So snoozlin, it, it's a Dutch word. And it's a treatment system where people uh, are either in a room or a card is brought to them that has different kind of fiber optics that show lights. There's music. There are things that get projected on the wall. Um, sometimes there's columns of water with bubbles going up. And it's a very soothing kind of um, situation. Uh, particularly useful for agitation. Some of the nursing homes in Ottawa have what they call a snoozeland room, where, which actually have cushions on the ground. And they'll bring their residents in there that, especially if they're the ones that are more likely to have agitation that goes over time. And, and that's really soothing for a lot of them. It calms them down. And then unfortunately, when the light goes on, sometimes those behaviors come back right away. One of the areas where it's particularly useful to do this would be when people who have a dementia are given a bath. Often they no longer understand why they're being put in this container that has lots of water, or why are they put on a chair with a hose that's spraying uh, water towards them, and they can get quite agitated. So snoozling sometimes can be helpful in that situation. But really, what works the best is training. Uh, helping people learn what the behaviors are, uh, try to learn how to go through steps to figure out what different triggers are. And sometimes, even if that doesn't make a difference, at least understand it as something that is less frightening than when you don't have that knowledge. And that can be equally helpful, because if the staff or if family caregivers are less frightened, then they're more likely to want to interact with the person who has a dementia. And that in itself can be helpful. So I'll show you another video. And this uh, has to do with using music in this situation. I have one resident that barely opened her eyes. She didn't respond. As much as I tried, I knew her for two years. No matter what I tried, massage wouldn't work, nothing worked. But when we got introduced to the iPods and the family told me the things that she liked, it was amazing once we put the iPod on her. She started shaking her feet. She started moving her, her head. Her son was just amazed. Okay, can we stop? Because now I'm getting no aura. <laughs> I'm seeing her all over again. How long has he been in the nursing home? Uh, approximately 10 years. He was having seizures, and my mother couldn't handle him at home. 
course it affected me greatly because he was always, you know, fun loving, singing, you know, every occasion he would come out with a song, no matter where he was. I remember as a child, he used to walk us down the street, me and my brother, and he would stop and do singing in the rain. He would have us jumping and swinging around poles. He was, you know, he was good. He was always into music, you know, always loved singing, dancing. His name is Henry Drea. Uh-huh. And I'm looking more or less for religious music for him. Okay. Because he enjoys music and he always quotes in the Bible. So I'd rather have that for him. We first see Henry inert, maybe depressed, unresponsive, and almost unalive. Henry. Yeah. Henry. Yes, yeah, so. I found your music. You want you want your music now? Well, not me. Okay, let's, let's try your music, okay? And then you tell me if it's too loud or not. Then he is given an iPod containing, we know, his favorite music. <laughs> And immediately, he, he lights up. His face assumes expression, his eyes open wide. He, uh, he starts to, um, to sing and to rock and to move his arms, and he's being animated by the music. And he used to always sit on the unit with his head like this. He didn't really talk to much people. And then when I introduce the music to him, this is his, his reaction every since. <laughs> The philosopher Kant once called music the quickening art, and Henry is being quickened, he's being brought to life. Yeah. I'm going to take the music for one second, okay? Just huh? to ask you a few questions. Okay? Thank you. I'm going to give it back to you. Uh-huh. Okay. The effect of this doesn't stop, because when the, uh, the, the headphones are taken off, uh, Henry, normally mute and virtually unable to answer the simplest yes or no questions, is quite voluble. Henry? Yeah? Um, do you like the iPod? Do you like the music you're hearing? Yes. Tell me about your music. Well, I don't, I don't, don't, I don't have one, I mean. It, it, uh, so no do you like music? Yeah, I'm crazy about music. You play beautiful music, beautiful sound. Did beautiful. You, did you play music when you were, uh, were you, did you like music when you were young? Yes, yes, I went to big dances and things. W what was your favorite music when you were young? Well, well I guess, uh, well, Cab Calloway was my number one band guy I liked. They did the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy, the holy. What was your fav favorite Cab Calloway song? Oh. I'll be home there for Christmas. Oh. You can count plans on me with plenty of snow, mistletoe, present, wrap around you tree. Ow! So, in some sense, Henry is restored to himself. He is uh, uh, remembered. Uh, who he is, and uh, he's, he's reacquired his, his identity for a while through the power of music. What, what does music do, do to you? It gives me the feeling of love, no, no mass. Figure right now the world needs to come into music singing. you got beautiful music in. Beautiful, oh, lovely. And uh, I feel the band of love, the dream. Lord came to me, made me holy, I'm a holy man. So he gave me this sound. The others say, I meet you. And say, Rosalie, won't you love me? Rosalie, won't you be sweet and kind? With this beautiful new technology, you can have all the music which is significant for you in something as big as a matchbox or, or whatever. And I think this, this, this may be very, very important in uh, helping to animate, organize, uh, and uh, bring a sense of identity back to people who are, who are out of it. Otherwise, music will bring them back into it, into their own personhood, their own memories.
their own autobiographies. So the important thing about that is that uh, the music has to be individualized to the person, has to be stuff that they like. Uh, if it isn't, if it's <laughs> Lady Gaga for someone like him, it might not work very well. But that's also uh, important in all the, that whole list that I showed. What's important is figuring out um, something that's individualized to the person themselves. And that's what's been found in studies looking at different kinds of treatment. Some people, music won't work, but in some, it will work very well. <coughs> Here's uh, another case, a case of B. B is bed-bound, incontinent of urine and feces, is edentulous, it's a medical term for meaning that uh, has no teeth, uh, and only takes a liquid diet, unable to communicate with caregivers, requires total assistance for all activities, does smile at the sight of others, often screams at night and does not easily go back to sleep. Uh, the caregivers are exhausted and stressed, and others who live with, uh, with her complain about their difficulty sleeping and dealing with their daytime activities. So let's say this is happening either in a residence or in a long-term care home, and someone there phones a doctor during the night to ask for something for this person. What can we do? What do you think often happens? A medication, some, something to put B to sleep. Now, B is actually my daughter when she was two months old. Okay. <laughs> so I, I picked her up and I patted her on the back. And I, I wouldn't be able to do that with uh, someone in a nursing home. But the thing is, is that, is that it, it's a similar kind of behavior, but we do different things um, that can create problems. I'll go back to another case I was talking about earlier, the 87-year-old lady lying in bed, approached by staff in the morning, screams, hits, get, uh, kicks, scratches, spits, has injured several staff, and some call in staff, uh, sick when they hear that uh, she's been assigned to them. So let's change the story. So. C is 23, okay, lying calmly in bed at home, approached by intruders, and she screams, hits, kicks, scratches, and spits. So it's normal behavior. Okay, so this, this is normal behavior, but it's in an abnormal situation. And, and a lot of these behaviors, if we actually think about what's going on, we realize, yes, they are normal behavior. The person who's running through the, the dining room might have been a sprinter at one time, and they're doing what they, but it's the wrong place to do it. And, and they can injure other people with this normal behavior. So we're always trying to balance how do we, how, what do we do about this normal behavior and modulate it in a way so that the people that are taking care of this person who needs care don't get injured? And, and that's a real challenge. It also illustrates why if you read in newspapers saying about uh, use of antipsychotics in nursing homes or other things like that, and there's the concern and what we look at our studies, the medications don't work that well in general because they're treating something that is normal. And so if, if I gave this person an antipsychotic for what she's doing, it would make her more sedated, but it wouldn't make her stop trying to protect herself from the intruders. There are some situations where medications are needed, but they're not that great in proportion to the majority of things that we see. So on that note, I'm going to show you another video. It's called 12 Minutes with Dementia. And actually, all of these you can find on YouTube if you're interested in them. More than 5 million Americans live with Alzheimer's disease. It's a long, hard road, not just for those who suffer from the disease, but also for the caregivers, children tasked with caring for an increasingly dependent parent. Four years ago, ABC had the chance to put cameras inside a Texas home 
as a couple took on this terrible challenge. And my co-anchor, Cynthia McFadden, has followed the family ever since. Cynthia? Terry, one of the things we learned over these years is just how little most of us really understand about the disease itself. I thought I knew a lot about Alzheimer's. But after Blaine and I took part in an experiment simulating what it's like to have the disease, I found out I didn't. It was 12 minutes that changed my life. I love you, Mom. Blaine Wilson's mother, Lawanda, came to live with him four years ago. He had just married his new wife, Georgia, five weeks earlier. Blaine soon learned it was much harder than he thought. Oh, God. Blake! She's going to drop her car. And later, she did. She lit fires. She wandered off. But Lawanda doesn't look sick, and she often seems fine, which makes it hard for Blaine and Georgia to understand how limited she really is. And that leads to frustration and resentment. Just tell her to wash her clothes. I'm trying to wash it. I bet you get her back. She knows what to do. Are you afraid? I mean... No, I'm not afraid. You know, I mean, it's my mother. You don't understand. The more we watched the tapes, the more it became apparent how little Blaine and Georgia really understood what was happening to Lawanda's mind. Do you really feel you understand the world your mother now lives in? No. What's I, going on in her head, her brain? I have no idea. I, I have no idea. I need to understand that then. I need to know what it's like. So I told Blaine about an experiment developed by P.K. Bevel and administered by her colleague Lori Labershack. The experiment helps families and caregivers actually experience what it's like to have Alzheimer's. I understand it's a pretty rough experience. It, so. it needs to be experienced. If it'll help me to understand, uh, I would love to. I agreed to undergo the experiment with him. Could you have a seat, please? Our journey into another world begins here, in this bedroom, where Blaine and I are suited up with some deceptively harmless-looking devices. Goggles simulating macular degeneration, glaucoma, and cataracts, conditions that older people with Alzheimer's often have. Likewise, latex gloves are placed on our hands, and our fingers are taped to make our hands feel arthritic, clumsy, hard to bend. Remove your shoes. A substance is placed inside our shoes to make it harder for us to walk. Ooh, that is uncomfortable. And on our heads, they place earphones, which emit an incessant jabbering, a clamor of noise that some Alzheimer's patients say is constant. Individuals with dementia say, we're hearing all this stuff, and they can't turn it off. Then we're each given five tasks to perform, and only 12 minutes to accomplish them. I'd like you to find the tie and put it on. I can't hear you. Blaine has a hard time concentrating from the start. Your time begins now. As he enters, Blaine is immediately disoriented. He staggers, reminding us of the way his mother looked on our tapes. Blaine tries to accomplish his first task, clearing the dishes off the table. But when he goes to put them away, he can't find the kitchen. So he gives up. Well, <laughs> I don't know where to put them. Blaine finally finds the kitchen, but he can't remember why he's there. And again, the similarities to his mother were astounding. She would open cabinets, and then she would shut them. Mother, what are you doing? Nothing. But Blaine is doing a lot better than I am. What the heck is this? It's only about two minutes into the experiment, and the noise from the headset is driving me crazy. God! So annoying! As I try to accomplish my first white task, find a white sweater, I work myself into a frenzy. White sweater. Remember, what I'm hearing is this. No. And believe me, it drives everything else out of your head. Right. Annoyed! This is tough. I felt confused, kind of panicky. If I had to go through very much of that, I just might go crazy. All right, that's not a sweater. That's not a white sweater. I mean, you do understand why people start talking to themselves. This is not a white sweater. I was trying to organize my mind by saying, OK. OK. OK, all right, all right, all right. Not a white sweater. Not there. I don't know about that. You're doing great. 
PK was in the room, and at one point when I sat down in frustration on the sofa, and she said, um, you're doing great. Why don't you start with finishing setting the table? And she told me what else I was supposed to do. I'll remember that. The reinforcement. Yeah, because you feel so alone. And you feel so frustrated, and there's no, you know, you, you don't know what you're supposed to do, and it's so dark. Reluctantly, I go back into the kitchen to try to find the plates. Glasses. How long have I been doing this? About 20 hours? I'm not doing great. I'm not doing great. And once again, I get distracted and go looking for that white sweater. This looks good enough. This is like a, OK, it's not exactly a sweater. All right, I'll put it over my shoulders. And I end up looking a little eccentric. Her son's going to say, Mama, you can't go out like that. Right. You're getting a little off here. God. In the meantime, Blaine has moved on to the bedroom, where he's supposed to match six pairs of socks. The hell? I don't know, man. Instead, he starts folding everything in sight. I swear, man, this is crazy. By now, Blaine seems to have forgotten his list of chores. He was supposed to have found this tie, for example, and put it on. Instead, he folds it along with everything else. Shoot. It reminded us of the time Blaine's mother set out to cook something for lunch, then got distracted washing dishes, and didn't remember until the pot was burning. Plates. After 12 excruciating minutes, the experiment to? was over. I give up. Blaine, your time is up. Huh? Your time is up. Oh, shit. What an unpleasant experience. Damn. Yeah. I couldn't do anything. Golly, Blaine golly. was visibly shaken. Yeah, what a way to try and get through each day. And uh, kind of scary. In what way? Uh, I, almost like uh, panic. For both of us, new insights. It's a, a deep sense of confusion. The thing that shocks me the most is that I couldn't remember five simple instructions. I couldn't imagine living like that. It's life altering. They need your help. They need your understanding. Amen. Despite the experiment, Cynthia reports that stress was too much. Lawanda is living with her sister and has had almost no contact with her son. Good luck to them. So basically what happened is that that part of the brain that got severed off by Phineas, in Phineas Gage's case, a similar thing was happening here, but with all that, uh, the stuff that they put on, the glasses they wore, the noises going on, they're not able to modulate any of that information as we would be able to do. So that's one thing. We look at what is it in the environment that might be triggering. Another thing that we look at after we try to figure out triggers is, is it related to uh, the dementia progressing and making a task that at one point was easy to do a difficult task? So for example, and what this is, this is uh, as a, a common scoring system, the mini mental state exam score drops from normal down to zero or mild Alzheimer's, moderate, severe, what people lose the ability to do if you actually look in the other direction, let's see, this is childhood development through teenagers. Uh, some people never make it up to here. <laughs> but anyway, so we'll take dress, uh, selecting clothes or even dressing. The arrow should have gone up to dressing. Here, as the person deteriorates, they start to find doing up the belt or the zipper very frustrating and you might have to make their clothes simpler, maybe ones with elastic bands so that they get less frustrated until the point where, as they continue to deteriorate, someone else has to do that for them. So we look at the triggers, we look at is the, uh, the, the dementia itself causing cognitive problems to a degree that they can't do their tasks, and we look at how do we simplify the environment, how do we reduce the stressors and then finally the last one of the last things or a lot of other things we can do but just in terms of categories is looking at did did they learn this for some reason and um, this is a lot more complex to do because you have to have quite advanced training to actually do the therapies 
that are useful. But the idea here would be that um, the only time the person with dementia gets some kind of interaction is when they start screaming. They scream, their caregiver comes along, and then it sets up a pattern that they scream to get the caregiver. And we look at ways how do we break that pattern because it's making the caregiver much more stressful. And the caregiver could be the, the sister, the son, the daughter, etc. And once we've gone through that, there was another little box uh, earlier on where I talked about psychiatric disorders having an effect. So we look at the possibility that we might be actually dealing with a psychiatric disorder that the person might have had at one time that's re-emerging, or a new one that's being triggered by the fact that parts of the brain are being damaged. And so we try to match up patterns we see to known disorders and then look at do treatments that we use for those known disorders, uh, would they be potentially useful? And it doesn't necessarily mean medication, because for example, we know that in anxiety disorders, in sadness, when people are withdrawn, uh, exercise can be a very useful modality. And that is often incorporated into the treatment of people. Now, up to now, I've been talking about this pattern mainly in the person who has dementia. But as Blaine illustrated, it also happens in the people who take care of those who have dementia, whether they be family members or not. And so you have the same thing going on. Stress will interfere with our ability to make decisions. Personal problems going on in our lives. Uh, substance use. And, and there are a lot of well-designed family therapies, caregiver therapies, that have been found to be very useful to help the people that are caring for those who have dementia be able to alleviate some of these problems so that they can become not only better for themselves, but also better caregivers as well. Um, when our ability to think doesn't work as well, we start to develop cognitive distortions. And if any of you have had very severe stress, some of these things might uh, might seem familiar, discounting the positives, jumping to conclusions, assuming that you know what other people are actually thinking and they might not actually be thinking about those things, uh, blaming others for the situation that you're in. When we work with, with families or we work with caregivers and residences and long-term care, we help them learn also different things that they can do to reduce their, their own stress levels. And just as a, one example here, asking a repetitive question, instead of the caregiver's misinterpretation that they're doing this to annoy me, that we teach them about dementia, they can't keep track of time. It doesn't mean that the person dealing with that, the one who has dementia, will never get annoyed again but at least it might give them some things they can think about that help give them a bit more energy to get through these situations. Stress inoculation is actually a system that was uh, invented by a professor at Waterloo University. Um, and basically what he said, and it's really common sense, is to when, whenever there's going to be an interaction between the caregiver and the person with dementia, to prepare for that interaction, deal with it, try to remember, almost have a mantra, I have to do this, 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 and this. Um, and that often will help with the feelings of being overwhelmed. And then after that, uh, evaluating how well they did and giving them some kind of, giving themselves some kind of reward to get through it. So in other words, preparing for the situation that you know is gonna be difficult rather than going in and hoping that a very good thing is going to happen. And then psychoeducation is, in a way, it is education, but it is, to some extent, a form of therapy. Psychotherapy is a form of education, and education is a form of psychotherapy. That if you think about when you went to school, from your learnings on all sorts of things, you became a different person after all those years of schooling. And essentially in psychotherapy, the same thing happens. So we call it psychoeducation. 
that we do with families or caregivers. And there are various different ways that we do that. But basically, it's to help them learn more about the illness and learn different strategies to cope with it, ways to change the environment, some of the things that I've discussed up until now. So it's, I have one more video. It's the last one I'm going to show. And then it'll be, I'll take some questions after that. But essentially, what I went through here was to talk about how behavior that we see is a reaction to some kind of stimulus. People who have dementia are less able to choose not to follow their own impulses. So we have to look at what is going on that seems to be triggering these changes. Is it their way of communicating that they're alone or they're bored or they're uncomfortable? So that's one thing. The second thing, is it a reflection of the dementia that is progressing and they're unable to do tasks that they were able to do before? And the third thing is, is it some pattern that the caregiver has inadvertently taught the person to do? And then once we've looked at different ways, we go on to see, is there something that looks maybe like a psychiatric condition that we know about that we might be able to treat that way? That's in the person. And then we almost do the same thing with the caregivers as well. Um, Physicians and nurses are also caregivers, and we also experience stress in dealing with the stress that families and other caregivers go through. So to some extent, we do the same thing with us. So the last video uh, brings a lot of these things together. So it's in Greek, but they're subtitles. <laughs> Είναι αυτό. Ένα σφουργίδι. Τι είναι αυτό. Μόλι τώρα στο παπατέρα σφουργίδι είναι. Ένα σπουργίτη είναι πατέρα. Ένα σπουργίτη. Σπου. Γι. Τι. Τι είναι αυτό. Γιατί το κάνεις αυτό το πράγμα μπορείς να μου πεις τόσες φορές σου είπα είναι ένα σπουργίτη. Δεν το καταλαβαίνεις. Πού πας.
δυνατά. Σήμερα ο μικρός μου γιος που πριν λίγες μέρες έκλεισε τα τρία καθόταν μαζί μου έξω στο πάρκο όταν ένα σπουργίτη ήρθε και κάθισε απέναντί μας. Ο γιος μου με ρώτησε 21 φορές τι ήταν αυτό και το απάντησα και τις 21 φορές ότι ήταν ένα σπουργίτη. Τον αγκάλιασα τρυφερά και τις 21 φορές που μου έκανε την ίδια ερώτηση ξανά και ξανά χωρίς να εκνευριστώ νιώθοντας στοργή για το αθώο μου αγοράκι. So who, who was the one who had the problem? Yeah. All right, so uh, that's the end of my presentation. I'm stick around for questions.